interactions with Alexa grow by 30% over the past 12 months. Well, you, you know, it doesn't always work because um, the other day on Monday, he said, Alexa, can you make it Sunday? <laughs> Hike, right? Because it knows me and should tell me exactly what to do there. Or when it gives you, uh, tells you that your thermostat had set a much higher temperature, whereas you're leaving, you should probably lower the temperature down. It's giving an advice to save energy. Cert similarly, certain customers, especially kids and elderly adults, are using Alexa in many different ways where it's really a companion. And for that, the AI uh, has to engage in much longer form conversations versus single-turn requests. That's already happening. And this is where 
affect in terms of understanding the emotional state and responding in the appropriate fashion is super important. And so how, how do you do that? How do you understand? You and I are talking. Yep. And if I talk like this, <laughs> you have a pretty good sense. And if I talk like this, you've got kind of a different sense. How do you train Alex on that? Because uh -huh. it's also, of course, my body posture when I make those yep. remarks. And if I come forward, how is Alexa interpreting all of that? Yeah, so that depends on what kind of sensors are available on the device. Uh, if it's only a microphone and no cameras, then all the cues for your how you're responding to the AI or uh, talking to the AI is dependent on audio cues and your prosody changes, your intonation changes, how you emphasize words change. Let me give you a very concrete example. When I ask Alexa uh, scores about my favorite teams, and if my team is winning, it should come back and tell me in a very enthusiastic voice that this team is winning. For instance, the New England Patriots for, uh, for American football. I know I'm in Europe and you follow soccer a lot more. Uh, but the same thing, and if my team's losing, it should be again in a not an upbeat fashion should tell the scores. That's a simple approach of where we're already trying, uh, already getting to experiment with the not just how you spoke, but yeah. what are you asking about or what are you talking to Alexa about? And that's very important. Did Alexa tell you that I'm a Patriots fan? Is that like <laughs> your subtle emotional manipulation? <laughs> what do you KPI it on, right? So when you're running a test and you're saying, we're going to experiment with this kind of answer versus this kind of answer, are you KPIing it on total number of engagements? Are you KPIing it on some metric of satisfaction? Are you KPIing it on like how much stuff people buy from Amazon that week? What is the KPI? Yeah, there's several. There's no one size fits all for this uh, because every particular experience is a little different. You talked about entertainment in terms of listening to music. Uh, if you like the song Alexa played, you would listen to it for longer. Yep. So that's a great cue. And if you're interrupting, then definitely Alexa did something wrong. So we have a fairly sophisticated machine learning based metric, which tells us whether what we did for the customer was it relevant or not. So think of it as a customer perceived satisfaction or defect rate. So that's an important KPI, the two user mm -hmm. terminology. Uh, but that's not the only one. The amount of time you listen to music can be another one. Yep. And if we gave you, a, if you were ordering something as a product, did you actually buy it? The one, uh, the suggestion that Amazon made through Alexa was it actually a good one for you? So the, all those are factors where those signals are incredibly important for Alexa to self-learn and make itself better for our customers. Got it. All right, let's talk about the sensors you have. You mentioned the voice sensor, but in the future and even in the present, Alexa is not just measuring voice. It's like looking at sound waves. It's looking at vision. It's, in fact, it's developing sensors that are superhuman. So. What sensors do we have now that might surprise the audience? And what sensors will we have in the future that will definitely surprise the audience? Yes, yeah, sensors are incredibly important for our vision of ambient intelligence because it's all about sensing what's in the environment and then responding appropriately. And I want to go back a bit in terms of what's the most potent sensor in this case is the microphone. I mean, uh, the first incarnation of ambient intelligence was the Amazon Echo. You could suddenly speak to the environment and the environment spoke back. So that's the most obvious one. But then the camera became a delighter. Uh, when I come home and uh, there's a note from my family for me, uh, it, if I have visually enrolled with Alexa, it shows me a sticky note relevant to me. So that's a pretty delightful experience where it says, like, my son has gone to, for tennis and you have to pick him up. <laughs> so that's a very important aspect of a sticky note that is, again, yeah. ambient, uh, power of ambient intelligence. Uh, there are a few other things, like ultrasound can help you uh, uh, tap uh, with just a tap gesture, shut off your alarm if you don't want to speak to it. So these are the kind of things that I believe sensors, uh, we have, it, this will keep coming better and better as the number of sensors grows around our world. And Alexa would be, the, uh, would be an important uh, AI that works on the background, connecting all these sensors, even anticipating your need to complete actions on your behalf. Okay, let's, let's talk about another thing that's going on right now. So this summer you announced that Alexa would be able to take just a minute a voice from a relative or any person and then read in their voice. And you had a, a very emotional ad of a, a child and listening to a story from their grandmother who'd recently passed away. And some people adore this feature and it scared the bejeebers out of others. So tell me about the feedback you've gotten and how you've adapted this feature. 
Yeah, first of all, that was a scientific breakthrough we were describing. And the grandmother was alive in that one. So it's, right. it's just not in the same uh, vicinity. Uh, and the, it's an incredible technology. It's, a, it's is, crazy. <laughs> well, I would say it's a scientific breakthrough that is helping us do many things faster. For instance, if Alexa needs to be a sportscaster and, and talk about like how a sportscaster would uh, speak, then that is essentially a very good way. The same technology is developing, is helping us develop many different kind of voices. And in terms of the personal voice, it's been uh, lots of people have said that they would want that feature. But we have to uh, think about what's the best use case. But that was a good demonstration for how you could take just, as you said, a minute of speech and produce high quality voice. OK, well, my children want to turn their Alexa into Snoop Dogg. So we'll see whether, um, <laughs> see whether that works. Let's talk a little bit about um, what's coming in the future. What is the most complicated problem you're trying to solve right now that you're not certain you're going to be able to solve in the next two years? Yeah, I think, as I mentioned, the roles that Alexa uh, is expected for customers to be gr uh, great at, it's the expectations are ever growing. And to do meet that expectation, the only way to achieve this vision that I described of the trusted assistant advisor and companion is for Alexa to be great at many tasks in not a bespoke custom development of AI, which is a huge challenge. Uh, just I mentioned the huge number of skills Alexa has. So you can't may do this through bespoke AI, and we have to invest a lot in generalized intelligence, where, by which I mean that Alexa needs to learn about multiple tasks it needs to get done before customers simultaneously. And second, it has to self-learn and adapt with minimal input to the changing environment. Mm -hmm. And these are incredibly hard challenges to do. And lastly, as I mentioned, that uh, with the ambient intelligence vision, Alexa needs to anticipate a lot more, automate a lot more what you uh, do on a routine basis. If you wake up in the morning, turn off your alarm, ask for traffic, play your music like you were describing, can Alexa automate all those actions where you just say, Alexa, good morning, and then just does those automatically on your behalf? That's an incredibly hard challenge. So as we uh, get more going on these, that's the kind of challenges that we have to solve. And it's already working because uh, more than 30% of the interactions in the smart home control are now all Alexa initiated without an explicit voice request. So they're not, it's not actually like following a flow chart. It's not, please do this, Alexa yes. looks. It's more of a question that Alexa has not heard before right. that Alexa is using generalized AI to respond to. Yes, so when, uh, there are two aspects to it. So when you ask something that Alexa knows about, uh, and it, but it's coming out of sequence, as you said, it should maintain that context to answer it. But then there is other issues that happen where you refer to, uh, uh, let's say in your home, you have a thermostat or a light and you call your light the reading light, but you've never said that, that right. this is my reading light. And if you said, Alexa, turn on the reading light, Alexa should come back and ask you, what's the reading light? Right. So this is where it should also engage in a dialogue with you when it doesn't know about what exactly did you want. And this is how we as humans learn. So this human-like learning and interaction skills is super important. So as Alexa becomes more intelligent and as it becomes more embedded in our life and as we get sensors in every device, privacy becomes more important. The best way that I would feel less concerned about Alexa and privacy is if all the action was done locally, right? If instead of sending my voice command to an Amazon you know, server somewhere, it actually just did it on the device. How much can we do locally now? And in the future, how much will we be able to do locally? Yeah, uh, think about like privacy and security, first of all, is paramount. Uh, I think we have to design experiences uh, with customer trust in mind, and that's what we are doing. I don't think it's a trade-off. I don't think it's a limitation. It's actually a huge invention opportunity. And local processing, as you said, is one of them. And many use cases necessitate that if you are in a car, uh, you can lose your connectivity often, and then Alexa should still function very well. And this is why we invested from very beginning on uh, what we call the Alexa hybrid engine, where bulk of processing happens locally uh, uh, so that you can recognize speech on the device itself. Other use cases, like which is again driven by both the seamlessness of conversations and privacy, as you mentioned, is you can say, Alexa, join the conversation where you don't have to say, uh, the wake word Alexa on every turn. And for that, you can imagine that, of course, we have to process locally. And this is a delightful yeah. experience that is available on our premium devices. Uh, for instance, the Echo Show 10, 
where the uh, Alexa figures out who's talking to you, uh, talking to it, and then also decides when to respond. Just like we as humans do, sometimes I'm referring to you, sometimes to someone else in, uh, in the same house. So that is the kind of capability that Alexa already has, and that is where all the processing is happening locally for speech, and even the visuals, if you have a camera on the device, and only for the information that Alexa needs to uh, process in the cloud that it goes and does the processing in the cloud and brings back an answer instantaneously. Got it, all right, so you've been working on Alexa for eight years now. Eight years into the future, um, where will it be and what will it do? Like, will I have a sensor in my <laughs> shoe and I'll tell it to tie my shoe and I won't have to bend down? Will it be, how, how deeply ingrained will it be in our lives, in your ideal vision? Yeah, as I mentioned, like we do want this AI to be available everywhere and for everyone. Uh, and I'm incredibly optimistic about that future. And the way I think about ambient intelligence is that it should simplify your life, reduce your the cognitive burden, so that it frees the time for you to spend with the people you want to spend time with and the experiences where you need to spend your time. So this is incredibly powerful in my opinion. And I'm very optimistic that as the sensory world changes where we have more sensors around us, on us as well in some cases, that this will be where the AI will be there everywhere for us. And I'm also humbled by the fact that it's not a technology just for the privileged. I hear stories from India where the Alexa devices are in remote rural villages where kids are interacting with them in, a, in schools where you, they don't have a computer with them, but they have an Echo Dot. And they can just learn about any topic with Alexa. So that I feel like that gives me a ton of optimism that this will truly work for everyone everywhere. And very quickly, put the people at ease who are worried that Alexa is going to turn into a generalized uh, intelligence that's going to turn them all into paper clips and use them as batteries. <laughs> so to me, that's not the dystopian uh, uh, AI image that I have. I am very, as I mentioned with the story in the AI, uh, that we have a very pragmatic view of AI and what needs to deliver. And if you put customers first, and put the right guardrails for that, I think we have to a very optimistic future where the AI will be beneficial for everyone here. Wonderful. Well, Alexa told me to end this interview on time, and we're right on it to the second. Thank you, Rohit. That was absolutely Thank fascinating you. and Pleasure wonderful to, to share the stage with Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Rohit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.